Okay. So uh, my second lecture today is um, based on what particular challenges are faced in engaging in mission to the Jewish people. I've always uh, tried to teach our missionaries in CWA that challenges are only opportunities that we haven't yet realized are opportunities. Um, one of my other favorite quotes, somebody said that challenges are what make life interesting. Overcoming them is what make them meaningful. And so there's never a, a time when I find some of the challenges, some of the quite serious challenges in, in, our, in our work of CWI to be um, something that tail spins me into panic because my experience is that the challenges quickly become opportunities. Now what I propose to do um, in this particular talk is to look at the two directions that some of our challenges come from. And those challenges are the Jewish people and Christians. Now it might seem a little bit strange for me to look at the challenge from the church. However, as we thought a little bit earlier, we need fuller engagement from the church that we currently have so that we can have greater gospel impact upon God's first covenant people. We have to speak two different languages in CWI, and I'm not talking to the fact that I speak Russian and Hebrew, but uh, we have to speak to the church and we have to speak to the Jewish people. And when we face the church, which is our sender uh, group, we have to speak a language that, that they understand. Uh, but when we turn to speak to the Jewish people, we have to speak a, a very different language that they, that they understand as well. Uh, the church is usually a non-Jewish culture, unless of course you're speaking to congregations in Israel that would be pre predominantly Jewish culture. And so this is true. It, it, generally, you know, if any Christian speaks to any non-church or unchurched person in the world, you want to be understood. There's no way that you can stand up and speak as if you're giving a Sunday sermon to uh, well-established believers and have any hope that a, a normal man or woman on the street is going to understand what you're talking about. We have to be adaptive in our language and how we communicate uh, the gospel to people. We understand who they are, where they're coming from, and sometimes that requires a little bit of listening from us before we start to, to speak. Some of the greatest missionaries in the world are, are some of the world's greatest listeners uh, because we need to know where people are and what their questions are before we start answering their questions or else we end up answering our questions and they're not interested in hearing the answers to our questions they want the answers uh, to theirs and so we have to find the words that ensure that people that we seek to reach for jesus have uh, have understood what we intend to communicate and cross commu cross cultural communication is is even trickier i don't know if you've ever t taken a very straight stick and put the stick into a body of still water it looked like the stick goes off in a different direction. And that's what happens to our words when they cross cultural boundaries. They often shoot off in different directions. And oftentimes, they end up meaning the opposite to what we, we intend them to say. And when our Christian language crosses a, a cultural boundary into the Jewish world, our words often sound very sinister and dark. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ear. And yet even the name Jesus, as it crosses the cultural boundary to Jewish people, takes on a sinister tone for many Jewish people who uh, feel that that name is the reason for all of the suffering of their people. And so how do you communicate the message of Jesus to a culture that even the word Jesus sounds sinister and emblematic of all of the horror and all of the murder and all of the persecution that they... How, how do you even start if even his name is, 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 is a problem? And so effective gospel communication means that we cannot merely repeat language that is understood in our sender group, you know, our church sending environment, and expect that our receptor group, the people that we're taking the gospel to, are automatically going to get it. And then have the audacity to believe that we're innocent of their blood because we've recited some, we've recited some formula, and somehow we can feel better that we've discharged our duty, and they can go to hell and I'm not going to be held to blame for it. Because that isn't, that isn't gospel communication. Uh, we have to um, preach to them and ensure that what they've heard isn't just our words, but they have really understood the gospel as we seek to communicate it in an understandable way. And not just that, we have to create an environment, an emotional environment for them to hear, not just with their ears, um, but hear with their hearts. 
You know, you may well preach, say for example, from my perspective at a non-English speaker, and then at the end, end of the day think that I've discharged my duty. But I know that that person's silence is not, uh, is not respectful uh, attention. It's, I've got no idea what you're talking about. I'm just smiling and nodding. Uh, we have to ensure that people understand what we're saying. And so good missionary practice is, is, is making sure that we understand the culture well enough, we understand the individual well enough uh, to ad adapt and the, use the, 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 the words that we will know have the, the greatest impact on them. And sometimes that means that we are not speaking of the language of our sender group. And sometimes the sender group will misunderstand that. And that's the challenge of cutting edge cross-cultural ministry because this, the sending church often thinks, well, are they preaching the gospel? Well, some, maybe they're not, but sometimes, more often than not they are. It's just you having to find a different language and different cultural ways to, to, to make the message that we're preaching as meaningful to them as it is to us. How can we communicate how sweet the name of Jesus is to Jewish people? How do we do that? Does it mean that we, 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 we don't use the name Jesus anymore? That might sound a little bit controversial. Of course, if I got into a time machine and went back 2,000 years to Galilee and saw Jesus walking down the road with his disciples and went, Oi, Jesus! Do you know he wouldn't turn around? Because he wasn't actually called that. He had a Hebrew name, which is more likely to be Yeshua. Now, he's the creator of all things. He knows everything. Of course, he would turn around. He'd know what I would mean, but you know what I mean. You know, we so enculturalize our experience and communication of the gospel to where we're at, our language, our history, our culture. I was saying a little bit earlier on to, uh, to, to some of uh, your students here who were having coffee that the power of the gospel is its ability to make itself at home in every culture that it gets to. The weakness of those culture is how quickly they forget where it came from in the first place. And so we tend to think that it is English, that it is European, uh, but it isn't. It was a, a Middle Eastern a Jewish uh, religious uh, um, phenomena. And so this is the challenge of, of all mission, all gospel communication, to make the message as meaningful as it is to us, to the people that we hear, that, that we seek to preach it to. And so that, that requires from us a, a level of engagement that isn't just talking at people or the kind of condemnatory preach style. Uh, that, you know, sometimes in the street people are condemning people. And that isn't the kind of loving engagement that I think certainly our country needs. Um, it needs a, a more meaningful uh, and, and compassionate declaration of, of gospel truth. So if we really think that we can be innocent of somebody's blood according to Acts 20 verse 26, we need to have made sure that as far as we can, according to our ability, that person has understood exactly what we're saying, not just intellectually, but also emotionally as well. Only then can you have any hope of thinking that in some way you can be innocent of, of, of their blood. So as we look at these two di different directions, I'll just briefly give a little overview of the, the areas that I'd like to cover in this talk. And so I've got three areas from the church and three areas from, from, the, from the synagogue. So what, what hinders Christians from sharing Jesus with the Jewish people? So these are three general areas I want to look at from the church. The first is interfaith or political rejection of Jewish mission. The second is the development of younger evangelicals and their relationship to mission work. And the third is mission is now confused as short-term sacred holidays or aid and political action. So that'll be the challenges we face from the church, from the synagogue. What hinders the Jewish people from truly hearing the message of their own Messiah and their own Lord? And the three areas I want to look at is the lack of evangelical engagement with anti-missionary polemics. So how do we at an academic level respond to their academic challenge to us? Second thing is the rise of the Orthodox, which is a great demographic challenge. And thirdly is the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Where was God in the Holocaust? More importantly, uh, the Jewish people will ask, where was the church? So let's just look at these first three um, uh, challenges from, from, from our own community, from the church. Uh, what hinders Christians from sharing Jesus with Jewish people? You know, we're an international, UK-based missionary society to the Jewish people. Most of our new missionary recruits don't come from the UK. In fact, now, Philip and I represent the only white British male missionaries 
in CWI. When I joined CWI, that's virtually all there were. And uh, now we've kind of, uh, we've, we've, we are a truly international mission in terms of both our mission, missionary workers and our office staff. And we've had to flip the old mission paradigm of raising UK missionaries to raise their support in the UK and then go abroad, learn a language and then start their ministry. You know, they learn a language in the hope that they might have something to say once they've got that language, which isn't always a guarantee. But now we have uh, indigenized and we're, uh, we, we uh, take on missionaries in their own country and they already have the language, they already understand the culture, the, the context, and so they hit the floor running. Uh, and it's a step of faith for us as a missionary organization because then we have to then get them established in their mission work, then bring them back to the UK to raise their support. So there is a, there's a price that has been paid for, for us as a mission. We've had to take a bigger step of faith um, in, in that particular regard. But, uh, you know, today's lack of UK recruits has given us an opportunity to uh, raise up indigenous missionary candidates in the country that we've placed them. And it's, it is very effective. I train them in situ and uh, then we bring them, as I said, to bring them to do deputation tours in the UK to try and raise up their partners and, and supporters. Now, although the word missionary isn't in the New Testament, and sometimes I think it's the NIV that mistranslates uh, diaconia, uh, which would be a service as mission, uh, the role of a missionary evangelist certainly is in the, in, the, in the New Testament. These are people that are committed to bringing Jesus to people that God has laid on their heart. And the real challenge of evangelism is that it requires as much of a change from the messenger as it does to the receiver of that message. And that's why mission is uncomfortable, because it requires we change as much as we're asking the people that we're preaching to to change. Because we're, we're, the, we're, those, we're those jars of clay. We, we, we contain the, the divine message of God's hope and, and truth. And a church that reaches the lost really ought to be a place where the lost want to be found. And this is true, reaching out to the Jewish people, the message of Jesus. Missionaries are, are, are called and committed to invest their whole lives um, in kingdom relationships with Jewish people that they meet. They specialize their knowledge, their experience, to become more effective witnesses in the culture uh, that they're involved in. Uh, they're not generally welcomed in the Jewish community when it's discovered that they're a missionary. The million dollar question for every new missionary is what happens when somebody says, so what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a missionary. <laughs> See you later. Never. Um, how, do you, how do you broach that? Uh, the M word in our work, you know, are you a missionary? That can, that can kill uh, any relationship dead. There's tremendous wisdom that's, that's needed there. We go to a culture that doesn't generally welcome any Christian witness to the messianic claims of Jesus. Just as a pastor in any local congregation has to specialize in the congregation and his local community and understand how the community works inside out, the social dynamics, which families don't get on with other families, even in the local context of uh, small villages and big towns, uh, they have to know it inside out so they can more efficiently and faithfully and fruitfully impact people with the gospel. So do missionaries. Missionaries have to invest that time in, in cultures, particularly like the Jewish culture, is quite um, unwelcoming to the gospel. So the, the first area that I'd uh, like us to think about is the interfaith and political rejection of Jewish mission. Now there is a post-colonial shame in, in mission because mission is often perceived and often was used by the state as a first wave of cultural domination. And that's made the concept of missionary quite passe in many areas of the world, particularly areas of the world that sent the missionaries into uh, to, tar to, to calm the native populations before the trading companies came in and, and did what they did. And so missionary becomes quite a problematic um, term. However, the message of Jesus is not about the triumph of one culture over another. It is the message of the triumph of the cross of Christ over sin and its eternal consequences for human beings. That's the triumph of the gospel, nothing to do with nationalism. But the very word and concept of missionary is being redefined. And in recent decades, as a result of this and many attacks on the concept of mission, fewer people are applying to join missionary organizations in general, especially 
as a lifetime vocation. Many Christians opt for respectful interfaith conversations, mutual learning, which is of itself not a bad thing. However, if that is all that it is, it's not a Jesus-honouring encounter that will show the way of salvation for all people. And so there, there is this challenge that uh, mission is, is not fashionable any, anymore. It's uh, almost uh, shameful parts of the world. It's, uh, you know, it's as uh, challenging for, um, the, the, for, for India and uh, for Africa as it is for Jewish people. For Jewish people, mission reflects bad memories of uh, the Spanish Inquisition, forced conversions, the burning of synagogues, uh, M Martin Luther ca calling on rabbis to be forbidden to preach on pains of death, burning their books, closing their synagogues, and if this solution doesn't suit, you find another solution, which of course is then cited by the Nazis as, well, we're only doing what Martin Luther suggested. Um, it's, it's a great challenge, so there is a lot of emotional baggage bound up with, with the missionary word, um, but we are missionaries, and we're, we're not ashamed of it, but we do have to work hard to redefine it, but the, the consequence for us as, a, as an organisation, there are less and less people in the UK particularly that are willing to consider missionary work as a lifetime vocation, and a lifetime is what's required to understand what you need to understand to be effective in, in our particular context. So that's the first challenge that we face and the opportunities that it's created is that we, we're seeing the Lord raising up our missionaries in other countries, so the Lord will not be left without a voice. Uh, his work won't, won't be frustrated by ebbs and flows of uh, popular culture and, 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 and Christian trends. Second challenge we face from the church is that of the younger evangelicals. It's a flowing through idea. According to Robert Weber, Weber who wrote The Young Evangelicals Facing the Challenge for the New World, he says there's a turning away generally by younger evangelicals from older traditional evangelism of decisionism and sinners prayers and instant conversions which is a positive move uh, but also they're moving away from pragmatic evangelism through friendship one-to-one -one relationships from the seeker services that were all very uh, uh, popular at one point with um, uh, was it the willow creek and places like that gradual conversion through guided inquiry sinners prayer to what is currently a kind of a younger evangelical you are seeing evangelism as a process made in the church community in their immediate neighbourhood, seeking a more holistic involvement with people. However, this is a challenging model, um, especially for reaching people in cultures that distrust and fear the church. Um, we need people who are willing to be incarnational and go into those communities to leave their church, to leave their comfort of a, a believing community and be Jesus in those communities, to be incarnational in places that don't welcome us, that don't, necessarily, that don't necessarily want us. We need those people in those cultures, outside of the church, and in many senses, this is exactly what a missionary is, a person willing to leave their comfort zone, their culture, the certainties of, and safety of their own faith community, and enter into another one. And in our case, willing to be incarnational in the Jewish world, to be those living letters as the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2. And in the sphere of witness to the Jewish people, it is much easier to lead people, Jewish people to Jesus than it is to a church building, because the church building does represent so much of negative history uh, to, to Jewish people. Jesus, however, is a very attractive option to Jewish people, a very attractive option. And there is a trend within the Jewish world to reclaim Jesus as one of their own. You know, it's uh, quite an interesting trend. The term missionary has not been consistently defined through church history, and young people are seeing, they're not seeing mission as a lifetime calling anymore, as a vocation. That, that kind of view of mission is, is declining. However, as a specialist ministry uh, and other specialist ministries, we need people who are willing to be dedicated to reach uh, specific people, groups, and nations. And this is precisely what it takes people with a call from God willing to make a lifetime commitment of learning and practice to see uh, Jewish people encounter the long-promised Messiah in a redemptive way. Therefore, the idea that a missionary is abroad and an evangelist uh, is at home is a false dichotomy. CWI missionaries serve at home in many, in many countries. Uh, Philip is serving at home, he's still a missionary. Asaf in Amsterdam, he's a, 
he's serving at home as missionary Gal and Aviel they're in, in Israel they're serving at home as missionaries so they're abroad to us where we are but they're at home for them so it isn't about where you were born and where you're serving it's what you're doing that makes you a missionary um, and so it is a false dichotomy to see uh, evangelist is somebody who stays in their own country and a missionary um, goes abroad over half of our UK missionaries are, uh, uh, that are serving here currently the UK is not their home country so the missionaries that we have here in the UK they're, they're serving in a foreign mission field so Grace in, in Glasgow from Taiwan she's serving in a foreign mission field Sarah Chan from Hong Kong in London she's serving in a foreign mission field Andrea in London from Romania she's serving in a foreign mission field so they're here but it's a foreign mission field for them if you see what I mean we live in a different world you know we're in a global village everybody's here everybody's there you know we can't see uh, mission as something that you do when you go somewhere else uh, mission is what you do when you put yourself into a, into a, into another culture and you're willing to give up some of your certainties and, 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 and comfort not necessarily physical comfort of having cockroaches in your kitchen or getting malaria or all that kind of stuff there's a emotional and uh, and a cultural d discomfort that you sometimes have to have when you enter into cultures that are different to yours but also very aggressively against the message that you're seeking to bring to them and so younger evangelicals are less inclined to invest their lives in full-time mission service especially for us in a sector where experience and knowledge that is required can only come with years of practical service and there's also a trend may add within larger churches to franchise mission as part of what the local church does in a way uh, uh, its members and maybe more importantly its funds never really leave the orbit of the congregation and many traditional interdenominational specialist mission organizations suffer from mission being com becoming something that the local churches offer as part of its annual activities for its members and while it is wonderful to see congregations engage with mission in their immediate neighborhood it warms my heart and seeing uh, teams sent for short-term mission work it's naive to think that the church can have the infrastructure and specialized knowledge and the expertise that mission organizations have accrued over generations there's also much to be said for a church to look beyond itself and look to send and support missionaries to the ends of the earth that means where they're not to people that they are not because there's a Christ-like sacrificial nature to missionary giving to a cause that you are not going to immediately benefit from you're not going to see people coming to your congregation you're not going to see your collection grow but you give anyway because it's for the cause of Christ it's for something that is bigger than us and so um, I think there is a, 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 some joy in being involved in something that the only benefit you have is hearing those incredible encouraging mission stories and rejoicing in the expansion of God's kingdom that you are able to play some part in through prayer and support of that work the last thing I'd like to think about very briefly as we look at the challenge that comes from the church is that mission is now confused as short-term sacred holidays or aid or political action mission has become a catch-all word for just about anything a Christian can do anything from mission trips to Africa where missionary work is building buildings digging wells which are all admirable and worthy but without the declarative dimension of faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God can it really be missionary work is it evangelism now the Bible doesn't as we noted use the word missionary or necessarily define it define it but an evangelist is a bringer of the good news and any good deeds that do not have the good news attached to it cannot claim to be missionary in this sense in fact there is no need to leave your own country to do mission work and in the mission subsection of Jewish work there are many ministries and works that take place that are worthy projects in and of themselves but aren't necessarily evangelism helping Soviet Jews to immigrate to Israel um, feeding Holocaust survivors clothing the poor you know all of these things are remarkable uh, help to towards people to improve their their daily life and they might be doing it things in Jesus name but without the explicit declaration of Jesus is just good works and it's not the gospel and it's not mission 
and we need to focus and believe that the gospel really is the answer to the world's most challenging problems. Now, let's think about the synagogue, the challenges that we face from the, ch from the synagogue. First thing I want to look at is the lack of evangelical engagement with anti-missionary polemics. Now, in the last three decades, we've seen a rise in anti-missionary, or as they like to call themselves, counter-missionary literature in terms of uh, countless websites and lots of books that have been written and very little has been done by way of response by Christian scholars to some of uh, the most challenging uh, uh, literature against uh, our own exegesis and understanding of Old Testament prophecy uh, and also the claims in the life of Jesus. Ironically, the anti-missionaries themselves draw from the research of many liberal Protestant and Catholic scholars uh, and they do this to debunk the messianic claims of Jesus and attack the veracity of the New Testament. And there have been attempts by various mission organizations and some messianic Jews to, to uh, respond. But to date, no notable leading evangelical theologians or academics have entered into the fray and we need the help of our theologians and academics to engage in this level. The anti-missionary attacks on the person and claims of Jesus the Messiah have to ultimately rely on a liberal, hyper-literal reading of the Old Testament. To read their own scriptures using a second temple hermeneutic uh, would leave the door wide open for Jesus. And therefore, they have to have this anti-supernatural, anti-prophetic, anti-foretelling interpretive matrix imposed on their reading of their sacred scripture. The sacred text of the, t of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, is flattened out to have this ultra-literal framework that makes the text only have one historical meaning. It can have no other future aspect to it. It has to be there. Many of their books and arguments have still been left unanswered. The most recent of these works, and probably one of the most notable, is a book by a man called Asher Norman, called 26 Reasons Why Jews Don't Believe in Jesus. Can you believe it that they even have a sleeve recommendation by an evangelical scholar, John Goldingate? I have no idea why he allowed his name to be put on that book. And the other sleeve credits come from apostates, Jewish people that were once pastors and missionaries who apostatized and converted back to Orthodox uh, Judaism. So, and he, he says, you know, I don't agree with Asher Norman, but as far as I can gather, his facts are correct. Well, his facts are Jesus isn't the Messiah and none of the Messianic prophecies in the New Testament are accurate. How's that a correct fact? Uh, it just, it, I am quite perplexed. Uh, at this and I would hope that our evangelical scholars could do better for us in this regard if I may make an observation about anti-missionary arguments they're like a magic trick the sleight of hand happens before the trick begins and therefore one must question the question define the definitions and not accept the restrictions of the formula of the objection or else you will find it very difficult not to be trapped by some very very clever arguments I'd like to give you some example of Norman's reasons why Jesus is not the Messiah. Maybe you're going to start thinking about how you would answer these. Here's one. There is no prophecy of a virgin birth in the Jewish Bible. That's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Of course, they would say that the virgin in, in Isaiah, the word Alma, and Betula, it's not virgin, it means young woman. Of course, we can refer to the Septuagint. I'm not giving you the answer. You have to work out the answer. Jesus' blood did not atone for our sins. Oh. Paul invented Christianity. The Gospels don't even agree with the names of the 12 disciples. So therefore, how can we trust it if they can't uh, agree with something as fundamental as that? The resurrection accounts are conflicted. There is not a messianic prophecy that the hands and feet of Messiah were to be pierced. They pierced my hands and my feet. Of course, they would say that there is a scribal error and that the Yud and the Vav have been confused and instead of pierced, it should be dug. Well, you try and dig your hands and see what happens to that, you know? Um, Jesus was not claiming deity when he said, I and my Father are one. Well, I wonder if you, you, you've, you've started to work out responses to, to some of those ones. You know, they, they don't believe that, uh, that, they, that the sh without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. They say, well, you know, you don't need blood to be atoned because poor people could offer a grain sacrifice 
and there was a difference between in intentional and unintentional sin. Uh, so it's, it could be quite an uh, intimidating uh, world to go into because things that you thought you were sure of, suddenly you were, oh, <laughs> how do I answer? I never realized you could be atoned by a grain sacrifice. So it isn't just by blood. What does that mean? So these are, these are quite, quite challenging um, uh, arguments to, to get involved in. We do need our scholars to help us. Um, and uh, in part eight of his book, he has this chapter that's uh, titled, The Torah Provides an Alternative to Christianity for Gentiles, in which he advocates something called Noahidism, that Gentiles need to keep the seven laws of, of Noah, and they don't need to become Christians. In other ways, it's another way of neutering Christians so they don't evangelize the Jewish people to have a kind of uh, a less threatening group of people. Um, so the anti-missionaries aren't just defending their position that Jesus is not the Messiah for them, but they're launching a full-on attack on the very foundations of the claims of Christianity, and those attacks are not being responded to. If anybody's looking for a dissertation subject, then this whole area of theological response to anti-missionary literature is chronically underdeveloped, and an area that the wider church could engage in to assist those of us more directly involved in bringing the claims of Jesus to to Jewish people. The second challenge that we face with uh, Jewish people is the rise of the Orthodox. There's a demographic challenge taking place. The one section of the British Jewish population that's growing is the ultra-Orthodox Jewish population. In fact, their birth rates have reversed previous decades of decline. Now, it is worth knowing that they prefer to call themselves Haredim. A Haredi means somebody who, who, who fears God. We often call themselves, we call them ultra-Orthodox. They don't like being called ultra-Orthodox. We're, we're Orthodox. How can we be ultra? We're already Orthodox. What's the point of that? So they don't like, ultra-Orthodox is almost slightly derogatory. But there's something quite, you know, if you're a football fan, you're ultra. That's not a very good thing, is it? Um, so this is a group in the next 20 years that we will find uh, demographically change the British Jewish community. And it will be dramatic in its change, unless, of course, uh, there's going to be an even greater demographic change with large numbers of Jewish people leaving the UK because of surging anti-Semitic attitudes. That's a very real um, possibility at the moment. In 2015, the Institute for Jewish Policy Research issued a report titled Strictly Orthodox Rising, what the, demog the demography of British Jews tells us about the future of the community. And it showed that in England, the Orthodox community was growing by nearly 5% per year, while the non-Haredi, the non-Orthodox community, was decreasing by 0.3%. So the secular Jews were having less babies, the Orthodox Jews were having more babies, and, uh, and so they will dominate the British Jewish community. Jonathan Boyd, who's from this Institute of Jewish Policy Research, told a conference about this, that the Haredim have been so successful in maintaining their numbers that they could double in size every 18 years. So by the end of the century, if trends continue, the majority of British Jewish people will be Haredi, Yiddish-speaking Orthodox Jews. Yiddish is a fusion of Hebrew and a German that was spoken uh, across Europe um, during the time of the, uh, of the diaspora. So the long view implication for CWI is if we have potential candidates, we need to get them to learn Yiddish already. And I've already been doing this. We have a, a young Jewish believer in London who four years ago I said, he expressed some interest, I said, start learning Yiddish, and he's doing Yiddish to his second degree, he's doing Yiddish um, for that. Uh, Yiddish words, I don't know, you realize they've been absorbed in, in, into British life. You know the word nosh? You know what nosh is? That's a Yiddish word, did you know that? How about glitch? Does your compu computer glitch? That's a Yiddish word. And even the word nick, you know, as in peace nick and beat nick, the nick is, is a Yiddish word as well. Maybe you know schmaltz. You know schmaltz is very schmaltzy. It's kind of Hollywood Yiddish, isn't it? It's a little bit cheesy. Or even a klutz. You know what a klutz is? Somebody a bit clumsy. So the Yiddish is, uh, you know, it's, it's around us already. But along with learning a new language, there comes the mindset. And we need to tune into their way of thinking and help them as we, help them as we reach them. In our summer outreach to London this year, we reached out to the whole of Stamford Hill, which is an orthodox area of London, big Yiddish-speaking area, and we had to make sure that we had Yiddish as well as Hebrew and English literature to reach that community as well. The real challenge of the Orthodox is that they're not a community that we usually see fruit from. 
And that community is really hard to get into because you don't look like them. You don't sound like them and you don't live like them. And it's quite obvious that you're not one of them when you come into the community. Um, and so it's not like going to Israel and being amongst secular Jewish people and you could be one of them and you can connect with them there as uh, a human connection. And sometimes our problem with reaching the Orthodox is we see more of a difference between them than there is. We can't see them as human beings that experience love, life, joy, hope, despair, death, all of those things. We just see the clothes are different than the beard and it, it, it's our own problem in reaching them. Um, but this wasn't the case over a century ago when CWA was founded because some of our first founders and all of our, many of our first missionaries all came from this community. They all came from the Orthodox Jewish community. So we're built on men and women who came to Jesus from this kind of background. And so we have a great opportunity ahead of us with a growing Orthodox population, but we do need to think strategically and we do need to prepare and have people who are interested in work, particularly in the, in the UK, thinking about Yiddish as a language option. Because if you want to speak to somebody's heart, you have to speak their heart language, don't you? I remember years ago going to, uh, uh, I think it was the ordination of, uh, of a Free Church of Scotland minister up near the, uh, up near the islands, and uh, the minute that the Psalms were sung in Gaelic, there was a raw emotion, that I, it, it hit me like a tidal wave. People were singing to God in their, in their own language, and there was an emotional connection. I, it was quite palpable, quite amazing. When you're in your own language, you communicate not just the accuracy of your ideas, but the intention and purpose of your heart. And so learning this language would be vital for future strategy for us. And then finally, probably the most familiar and challenging one is the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Where was God and where was the church? This is the biggest challenge that we face day to day. It's the question we often get asked by Jewish people, where was God in the Holocaust? And equally hard to answer is where was the church? This has taken on a renewed urgency with the rise of anti-Semitism because violent words breed violent deeds. And once again, there's lots of violent words being spoken and violent deeds being done. There was a young man who was brought up in a reformed evangelical congregation in America, took a gun and went into a synagogue in Powie and sought to murder people. He did kill one worshiper in the synagogue, shot the rabbi through his hand. And this man attended Escondido Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, it's a, you had uh, one of their representatives at the General Assembly this year, and he's on our American Council, in fact. And it's just sad. Here is a person that can sit and listen to good theology, good pr preaching, and then still feel that he, as the son of an elder of that church, can take up a weapon and go into a synagogue and seek to murder people, succeed in killing one and injuring others. He left a, um, a, a document explaining his motives which are mostly theological mostly couched in classical accusation of deicide that the jews killed the, killed jesus and with a theological theology framework and this is how he justified his murder of a jewish worshiper and injury of others in response to this the opc denomination said in a statement on its website that anti-semitism and racist hatred which apparently motivated the shooter have no place within our system of doctrine and uh, later another OPC minister, Reverend Mika Edmondson, said, we can't pretend as though we didn't have some responsibility for him. He was radicalized into white nationalism from within the very midst of our church. So sadly, the rise of anti-Semitism is still not being taken seriously enough in many political and social circles. It's the one form of racism that can still be politically rationalized. It used to be the one racism that could be theologically justified but now it's in the realm of politics where, it's, where it seems to be okay. Jewish people will, for example, compare and contrast the number of statements by churches, denominations, and Christians, Christian organizations to condemn Nazi racism to the Jewish populations under their control during World War II, of which there was zero. And they will compare it with quite how many statements and declarations have been made regarding Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. Laying politics aside, the point I want to make is a simple one. When actual genocide was happening, the church lay silent. And we must allow the force of this challenge to impact us. We have to deal with this as we 
create a response to this harrowing stain on human history, this harrowing example of how can there be a God when evil exists? And this is probably one of the more horrendous examples of it. Jewish people have often told me that they have six million reasons why they don't believe in God. Or if they're not an atheist, they'll say, I have six million reasons why I don't believe in Jesus. And every one of them died in gas chambers, were killed by mostly baptized Christian members of denominations, and none of them were even excommunicated by their church. Even Nazi leaders after Nuremberg war, war trials, they weren't even excommunicated by the denominations. What does that say to the Jewish people about how church organizations and denominations value people that are murdered that they would quite happily allow them to continue to be members of their churches. They can come and take communion if they want to. They could serve communion if they want to. Most of the camp cars at places like Auschwitz were baptized members of various Christian denominations. You know, we can say one thing, but we need to do that same thing as well. And so it's a real challenge. We have to find a way to weep with those who weep, to mourn with those who mourn, and at the same time share with them the message of Jesus whose one death once and for all gives us hope, light, and life everlasting. As you've gathered from these six challenges, these six opportunities, our field of witness is a rather complex one. And we value your prayers, we value your partnership. Maybe you will have a direct involvement with us in the future. Maybe I'll be interviewing you in five, ten years' time to become a missionary with us. Maybe you do feel called uh, to participate with uh, in other ways. Maybe you want to take up the challenge to answer the anti-missionaries uh, in a scholarly and academic level, to take on their arguments to help us in that way. This is a really important uh, involvement that you can have. We certainly need our theologians and thinkers to engage with us and help us answer these challenges. But more than that, we'd love to stay in contact with you. I don't know where you're going to go from here, and where the Lord's going to take you on your journey, but it's certainly going to be an exciting one if I look back on my life and see where the Lord has taken me. You trust him, he holds your hands, and he'll take you to places you never imagined you could go or would go, would want to go. But it is an amazing journey to, to follow the Lord in obedience. But if you want to stay in contact with us, the easiest way for you to do that, we have cards on the table at the back. One's got his photograph on it, one's got mine on. Um, uh, just... It's probably easy just to put your email there because you're going to be moving a lot. Uh, but if you want to give us your postal address, you can. We've been blighted, as everybody has been, with GDPR and all of the legal requirements of getting permission to have your contact details. And uh, we don't sell them or pass them on to anybody, and we only use them for uh, missionary news information. This is our magazine that comes out once every two months. This is a report on our outreach in London. There are copies on the table. I really would value it if you all took one and you'd pray for us. Um, if you want to get... All of our missionaries give a, a newsletter three times a year as well. So if you want to get Philip's newsletter, you can fill it his card at the back and just leave it at the table and we'll take it and make sure it's processed uh, at, at the office. But these are the only ways that we can legally stay in contact with you. And I hope that you will. Uh, one day when your pastors are involved in churches and... Somebody from our office phones up and say, hi, we've got a missionary that's coming. Would you like to have them come to your church? Says, oh, yes, we know CWI, of course. <laughs> so um, please, um, even if it's just taking the magazine, but it would be valuable for us if we can, you know, stay in contact with you in your journey as you prefer for ministry and then you get involved in ministry wherever that might be um, because our work is your work. Um, we can't separate ourselves from, from, from God's wider body. We, we're all involved in this together. Paul talks about us being workers together with God. And we're absolutely convinced of that in CWI. Um, so thank you so much for, for your attention. I don't think I've left much time for questions. Well, I want to allow uh, you, Richard, well, first of all, to say thank you very much indeed. That's very, very helpful once again. I want to allow a little bit of time uh, for some questions, if you have, uh, so I don't mind stealing a little bit of time. Uh, would anyone like to ask Richard anything? Yes. You mentioned earlier that you said your CWI was a pillar, a USP of, of, of being you know, reformed for your yeah. organization. How do you find, so in terms of the work that you're involved in, how do you find engagement with, with, with other Christian organizations operating to, to in potentially in mission to the Jews, but with both? Is that, is that something that takes up a lot of time in terms of just navigating those kind of relationships with other organizations or is it 
Yeah, good question. So how do we as a reform mission interact and interface with other organisations that don't hold our fundamentals? So all of our missionaries, when they join, have to, they have to sign to the consensus of the reform confessions of faith and then sign to one of them. That's all the missionaries. Who we work with, we'll work with whoever, whoever's biblical who work with us. So we have partner organisations. We have a very kingdom mindset pragmatically when it comes down to things. If we're opening a work in an area where we have no office, no infrastructure, you have to find a way to pay your missionary, to get them to pay their taxes, their national health. You have to do all of these things as a legal employer. That costs a lot of money to set it up and to run it. So if there's another organisation there that already have all of that, then what we do is we second our missionaries into that organisation. So our missionaries in Israel and our missionary in, in Hungary, in Budapest, we've seconded them into Jews for Jesus. They have reformed people amongst them, but they've, they're, they're not particularly uh, reformed in their theology. Um, some of them are. But th we have the same commitment, the same focus in mission. And so we have our missionaries, and we, we like to put our missionaries in teams, not have them work by themselves. Um, and so we've tried to have a kind of a bigger kingdom vision of things, not just all CWI focused. Obviously, there would be some organizations that we wouldn't work with if they didn't have the very focused gospel proclamation uh, d dimension that we're committed to. So that would probably be where we would draw our, our, our lines, but we will work and partner with, and my missionary in Paris, for example, he's works very closely with uh, another missionary from uh, an, an, another mission, an American mission, in fact. And theologically, we're kind of poles apart, but as, as local missionaries, they support with one another and work with each other. So as much as we can, we try to be as generous as possible uh, and not, not be arrogant in our sense of our, the our theological commitment or our heritage. We want, it to, we want our, our doctrines of grace to engender actions of grace and attitudes of grace. Yeah. Any other yes. Okay, so the question is, where are Jewish people found? Are there any trends? So um, America and Israel are the two major populations. It used to be, I think Israel is coming on par, if not over, soon to overtake the, the Jewish population of America. Um, there is, a, a, in Europe, a large community in France, of course, there were a lot of Jewish people leaving there because of the is Islamic fundamentalist driven anti-Semitism that's taking place. Um, uh, Germany surprisingly has a, a large number of Jewish people, a lot of them are Russian Jews or Jews from Israel that are moving to, to Germany. Britain, um, there's uh, uh, probably coming up to a quarter of a million Jewish people in Britain. In Australia, we've just um, a month and a half ago started two new missionaries in Sydney. There's 30,000 there and our missionary in um, in Taiwan, we're just in the process of trying to get a visa for him to, to go and join them to build up the team. So we have a local Australian council. Um, but we had, we've had many, many years of work in Australia, but then our missionary retired and another one left. Uh, so we're just rebooting the work there at the moment. So, yeah, and of course, Russia, there's still a large work in Russia. At the moment, we're just looking and we're just having discussions with another mission organization, um, they only employ Jewish people because it's their USP. Um, but they have Gentiles involved that they would like to be involved in the work, but they can't employ them, asking us if we can employ them and second them to their work. So we're just in discussion at the moment, potentially somebody in Moscow as well. These are all complicated discussions, you know, but there's opportunities. And that's, you know, the, a broader willingness to engage with people that aren't carbon, carbon copies of us helps us to facilitate mission work where the Jewish people are. But at the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty in Europe. You know, will those populations stay the same? And throughout human history, uh, Jewish populations have gone in different places. You know, 1492, the Jews were expelled from 
Spain by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand and they ended up going into the Arab countries and that's where you have Sephardi Jews or Mizrahi Jews as they're called in Israel who are often Arabic speaking Israeli Jews from Morocco, Yemen all of those places so I, I don't think for one minute that they're just because they're where they are now they're necessarily going to stay there looking back at history but at the moment growing numbers in Israel still a large community in America but you know with the synagogue shootings and the rise of uh, white nationalists um, it's a very um, uncertain moment in history for a lot of Jewish people around the world yeah. there was one over there yes Yeah, Orthodox Jews and Liberal Jews are, are, are very, very different. Um, liberal Jews would often go to a Reform synagogue, and there's not some, there's not, they're not very Reformed from our perspective. Um, you know, Liberal Jews uh, wouldn't believe in a literal Messiah. They believe in, um, in a Messianic age. It was a joke, joke told, you know, uh, boys nagging his father about, uh, Dad, can I, have a, can I have a bicycle for Hanukkah? And he goes, yeah, when Messiah comes. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Um, so the hope, the hope that will never happen. The Hasidic Jews, of course, and our challenge is that we think they're more biblical. You know, they're the people of the book. But it's inaccurate, the people of many books. The Bible is one of them. But the most important thing would be the Talmud, which is a series of commentaries on the sacred text. And that is, you know, that develops into a written body of work, which in the time of Jesus, it's referenced as the tradition of the elders. And that's often the point of departure that Jesus had with with some of his contemporaries, their interpretation at, at that point. And so with the Orthodox Jews, um, you know, it's surprising how close they are to us at times, but how far away they are too. They believe in things called Gilgul Hanefesh, which is the transmigration of the soul. You know, they believe in reincarnation. They believe that you can be demons possess something called a Dibuk, which is somebody else's lost spirit getting trapped in your soul. So some dead part person's soul wants to air and be in your soul you know it's uh, some strange concepts um, so uh, it's, it's quite mystical the Orthodox Jews of course rely very much on the Kabbalah which is mystical literature almost um, uh, it's kind of new age-ish so you know but then on the other hand at least they believe that the Bible is from God and there's a God and that we can read the Bible literally and God still wants to speak to us which isn't always the case with the liberal Judaism. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs>